The time has finally come. The long wait is over at last. Saw X is here. So I think it's safe to say that I have spent a good portion of this year just getting really excited for Saw X. Tobin Bell was coming back. We're going to be getting this missing chapter in the Saw saga that we all love so much. Saw X was going to be set between Saws 1 and 2, amongst that golden period of the original trilogy when John Kramer was still alive. And Shawnee Smith was also coming back as Amanda. How could that not be amazing? Because Saw X promised a very personal Saw film. John Kramer is at a cancer support group, where one of the people that he meets there tells him about this revolutionary new method for beating cancer. John finally seems to be given hope, once again, that he can turn his life around. Only, as it turns out, it's all just a scam. Kramer flies out to Mexico, only to be cruelly duped. And so begins a new series of deadly games, as John Kramer, with a little help from his friends, tracks down the scammers responsible and proceeds to feed them his own brand of justice, one brutal surgical trap at a time. But is John Kramer still beholden to his own very strict moral code, or has he finally crossed the line, now motivated only by this incredibly personal urge for revenge, after having been toyed with in such a cruel fashion. So, of course, I had an absolutely fantastic time watching Saw X, just seeing these characters that mean so much to me and all the other Saw fans back on the big screen again, like nothing had ever happened in the years in between, just feels magical. There's really no other word to describe it. And this is a story that absolutely understands that. It understands that his audience actually cares deeply about John Kramer. He's almost entirely recast in this as a tragic saviour character, wrongfully and cruelly given hope that he might turn his life around, so that when the games actually do begin, we're seeing everything through his eyes. This is a Saw film that's notable because it plays out almost totally linearly for, I think, the only time in the series' history. There's no big flashbacks, there's no kind of intertwined timelines, or even major sort of twisty turns. Instead, it's a sombre, character-driven revenge story, where we're not following the horrors of waking up a room and being strapped into some hideous trap, we're seeing things play out totally from Jigsaw's perspective, and we want him to get the justice that he deserves. And that is really just such an interesting dynamic to play with. John Kramer has never seemed as vulnerable, or as human, or as tragic as he does in Saw X. Tobin Bell just absolutely lights up the screen, especially in the first act, the first kind of half hour or so, where he fully transitions from being this great horror villain to a believable and empathic leading man. He's gone from being the Saw film's greatest asset to finally just their absolute star, no longer just this shadowy, manipulative presence that's sparingly used. And Tobin Bell is, of course, absolutely up to the challenge of carrying an entire film just based on his charisma and presence alone. His scenes in Saw X are absolutely 10 out of 10 some of the best stuff in any Saw film. There isn't a single line of dialogue in this that doesn't feel totally true to who John Kramer is. The first act might actually be my favourite half hour of any Saw film to date, because of how perfectly it's able to make you feel for John Kramer. And what's interesting is, one of the byproducts of that, along with being structurally much more straightforward, is that Saw X is notable for being, by far, the most morally straightforward Saw film. There's a total absence of the series' kind of trademark moral complexity or philosophical grey areas. The baddies in this film are very bad. They do nasty things, and pretty much everybody who ends up in a trap in this film first gets a chance to show that they're extra, irredeemably rotten, down to, at one point, literally threatening children. Whilst John Kramer, on the other hand, is made out to be extra benevolent. 
this kind, noble, almost messianic saviour who is given more chances than ever in this film to show that he really does believe in fair play. Now obviously, playing up that contrast is a deliberate choice, and it's one that I completely understand, even though I think there are maybe a few moments in this film that really are notable for featuring really obvious, almost kind of comic panel storytelling beats that I think bear the hallmarks of Josh Stolberg and Pete Goldfinger's writing style. The guys that brought us Jigsaw and Spiral might have struck lucky with this one, but I think that a lot of Saw X's success comes down to how good the overall production is, that it relies on Tobin Bell's performance so heavily rather than necessarily on its script. Because one of the things that I found myself noticing is that it's amazing just how often this film sets up an interesting idea that could add in some moral uncertainty or conflict and then does absolutely nothing with it. For instance, you've got the character of Gabriella, who's this unscrupulous drug addict. There's this whole thing about her and Amanda having some sort of a connection. Amanda sees in Gabriella a shadow of the woman that she once was that she's trying to put behind her. And there's the suggestion that she feels conflicted about making her play a game. But then, that's a plot point that never really goes anywhere. It doesn't really ever amount to anything. And then you've got Ellie Peterson, who's the main sort of baddie. There's all this stuff where she tries to convince John Kramer that there's still some kind of hope for him, that her father could in actual fact save him, and that she might not necessarily be as guilty as he thinks she is in duping him. And the fact that they set up this conflict, that John Kramer's got this moment of doubt, could she actually be telling the truth? Has he jumped the gun and let himself be motivated by revenge, and in so doing, cost himself his last hope? And I feel like that would have been a really interesting dynamic to play with, that once again, never develops once it's brought up. And then there's this fantastic scene early on, where for really the first time since flashback scenes, we see somebody actually survive one of the games, and then John rushes in, and he starts bandaging the guy's wounds. Because in Saw X, the games are made out to be much fairer this time, and people actually survive. And I really wanted to see that moment play out, where somebody survives the game, and we see John give them the talk, and we actually see the aftermath of that. But then, it's like they can't ever let anything too radical happen. They can't let any of those interesting ideas affect the overall shape of the film. That it's a revenge story with a series of trap set pieces that play out largely as you'd expect a Saw film to play out. Because once we get our group of victims all chained up and ready to go, there really isn't anything that's that drastic or unexpected happens. It feels like every opportunity to deliver on what the first act promises, which is a really different Saw film, is shot down in favour of just making a damn good Saw film that runs along largely familiar lines. And the second half of Saw X is pretty much just that, a damn good Saw film. But for me, I think it's big shortcoming when you compare it to the rest of the series, which I guess comes down in part to it being a prequel, is that it feels like it's got a lack of stakes. There's no major plot points in this film that ask us to really reconsider anything that we then see later on in parts 2 and 3, if you were to watch these films in actual chronological story order. Instead, Saw X plucks John and Amanda out of the timeline, gives them a great standalone story, and then pretty much deposits them back at the start of Saw 2, ready to go, but largely unchanged. There's no hints of the kind of inner turmoil that we learn plagues Amanda in Saw 3. There's one decent conversation about Jigsaw's legacy between him and Amanda, and there's really no significant character moments that, to be honest, stand out. But it is, of course, just great to see them back together on screen. I just sort of wish that it could somehow have been a little bit more tied into their characters' kind of overall developments. Because it kind of feels to me, and I might be completely off here, it has happened before, but I can't help but feel there could have been, at one point, 
a version of Saw X that existed that had a lot more connections and more resonances with the franchise as a whole. And I don't mean just crap lazy easter eggs, I mean real, genuine, important connective tissues to who these characters are that demonstrates an understanding of where they are in the timeline, and instead a conscious decision was made to keep that stuff to a minimum as much as possible that this was a film that, like Josh Stolberg and Pete Goldfinger's other Saw films, was meant to work pretty much as a standalone entry, with just a kind of basic knowledge of the characters required to actually follow what's going on. Now, maybe that's just me being massively cynical, but for me, this is still an absolutely phenomenal film. It's easily a top three of the year for me so far, one of the best cinema experiences I have had in a long time, just because this series and these characters really do mean so much to me, and it feels good to see them being treated so well. This is no bringing back of beloved characters as tired, broken down shells to be killed off, or a betrayal of the core identity of what this franchise is. This is just a really good Saw film, with as advertised, more Tobin Bell screen time than any other film in the series so far. I will say it's probably the least smart and twisty Saw film. I don't think that the big Zep moment at the end that you're waiting for is particularly that shocking or memorable, and it's actually fairly low-key, but then it is definitely a top three when it comes to the emotional side of things that the franchise often neglects. The brutal, flashy violence and sort of razor-sharp twists and turns have really been replaced by something more sombre, more emotionally resonant, and much more guided by a sense of morality. Because what this is, and it's strange to say this, is that it's the Saw film that you'll come away from feeling morally cleansed. It's the only film in the franchise that ends on a truly happy note, with a sense of good having triumphed over evil. So for me, I'm going to break it down like this. The first act, absolutely phenomenal, stone cold 10 out of 10 classic. The middle act, the traps, the John and Amanda dialogue, is I think an 8.5 out of 10. There's a few daft, slightly heavy handed bits of writing that I think bring it down a little. And then the last act, for me, works emotionally, but then it does have maybe some of the most oversimplistic bits of writing. And that, for me, is coming in at a 7 out of 10. So if you add that all up, then it works out at an average of an 8.5 out of 10, which I think is still a really strong rating for this film. And you know, maybe in time, I might even bump it up to a 9. Because it is absolutely a great film. I wholeheartedly do recommend it. And really, to be honest, most of the issues that I've got are just when you compare it to some of the other Saws. The best of which are, quite honestly, some of my favourite horror films of all time. But you compare it to most films that are made these days, then Saw X is an absolute classic. And I welcome it with open arms into the ranks of what is absolutely my personal favourite horror franchise of them all. Because this film just completely captures that fantastic, golden era, vintage Saw feel. The only major differences being that it trades the sort of usual plot twists and innovation for emotion. And it swaps out any moral complexity and shades of grey and philosophising for, as odd as it sounds, a feel-good ending that treats these characters with the love and respect that they deserve. And that is absolutely fine by me.